Hey there everybody, welcome back to the Physics Fun House. Today we're studying electrical conductors. Our starting point is our old friend the aluminum can from last year. Remember that an aluminum can held near a charged rod will always roll towards that charged rod regardless of whether or not it is a positively charged rod or a negatively charged rod. And we use this to understand the concept of polarization, the process by which charges inside a conductor are separated based on their um, proximity in an electric field. Today we want to understand a little bit more what's going on inside the conductor. Let's get started. So what I have here y'all is the same setup we were working with before where I have two point charges connected to either ends of my 18 volt battery in my little tray of water but this time I've added a ring and this ring is made out of aluminum that's basically just like what you would put on like a dryer vent or something like that I'm gonna put that aluminum ring or conducting ring if you will inside our electric field and I'm gonna pick up my little electric potential probe I've got my voltmeter again set to a 20 volt range and I'm gonna kinda of probe around the electric field in this situation and so what you'll notice is if I've got it real close to that charge I still get you know a big positive number positive six almost if I put it real close to the negative charge I get like negative six something like that if I put it right next to the ring eh, it's kinda of small it's like two and a half or so if I put it just inside the ring it goes down to like 1.3 and the important thing that I want you to notice is that when I move it around in the ring that that voltage doesn't change a whole lot. Yeah, I moved it just a touch. So that's going to be true even if the ring itself is charged. So if I take the yellow banana clip and I move it here. Now the ring itself is charged and so if I put it here it's like 9 volts. If I put it over here still pretty much 9 volts. If I put it in the middle still pretty much 9 volts. So just very, very slight changes in electric potential anywhere inside the ring. Just outside the ring, it changes very quickly as I go towards the still negatively charged um, piece of copper. But inside the ring, it's constant. And so that's a really, really, really important little fact, one that we really need to understand. So let's get to work trying to understand it. So what we can do with a more careful investigation of that electric field, kind of like what we've done with the electric potential lab in the past, is get a map of the electric potential as a function of position. And the data looks, again, like, like this, just a row of voltages going both horizontally and vertically. And when you plot it making a 3D surface plot, you get a plot that looks like this. And that conducting ring is right here in that electric field. And so as you go from the positively charged um, dipole to the negatively charged, it generally slopes down. But here in the middle, there's this flat region. If we kind of drop the perspective just a little bit, maybe not that much. You can, you can more clearly see there's this plateau right here in the electric uh, potentials. And so what that tells us is that inside that ring, the electric potential is staying constant. Remember next that the electric field is the slope of this graph, the potential versus position. And so if this graph is flat, then that means that there's no electric field inside that ring. And that's kind of a really important thing for us to notice. And so the first thing we need to kind of remember about an electric conductor, and we've seen plenty of evidence of this so far, is that charges are free to move around inside a conductor. Today we also kind of need to consider the fact that they move without losing any energy. And so since charges inside a conductor can move without losing energy, that means that the electric potential inside the conductor must be constant as in any point within the conductor, the voltage is always going to have the same value. That also means that the electric field inside any conductor has to be zero, since the electric field is the rate of change in voltage with respect to position.
And so inside a conductor, when you put charge on it, the charges will quickly reach an equilibrium position so that they are relatively uniformly distributed. And in physics too, we're only really gonna consider spheres of charge. So they'll be relatively evenly distributed about the edge, the exterior surface of the sphere. And what that means is that the electric field is going to be perpendicular to the surface of the sphere. So since the surface has to be at the same potential, just like everything else inside the sphere, and equipotential lines are perpendicular to the surface, that means that the electric field is perpendicular to the surface of the conductor. And so the surface is an equipotential and the electric field lines are perpendicular to the surface. So in a sphere of charge, inside the charges are basically all balanced and the forces on those charges are balanced and the charges are in equilibrium with each other. Outside of the sphere, the charge acts like it's concentrated at the center of the sphere. So let's draw some pictures illustrating that. So here is a charged sphere. I've chosen positives because they're easier to draw, easier to see. And if we pick a, another charge inside the sphere, and there's the center of the sphere. If we pick another charge inside the sphere, like that red one right there, we kind of think, all right, what is going to happen to that red charge? Basically, what that charge sees is nothing. Like all the forces on that red charge are balanced, it's in equilibrium, and so it's almost like nothing is even surrounding that red charge. And so if I were to go, well, what are the forces on that thing? The, there would be no forces. Um, the charges to the right, to the left, above, below, and front, behind are all balanced, and so that red charge is essentially just there, nothing is surrounding it. Um, so the electric force on it would be zero, so the electric field would be zero. The voltage, however, would be a very large positive value, since in order to get that red charge there from infinity, you would have to do a substantial amount of work in pushing it. And so even though the charge is in equilibrium, and we've seen this a few times, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have any energy. And so an analogy would be like a book on top of a bookshelf. The forces on the book would be balanced, but it would have energy because it took work to put it there on top of the bookshelf. Same kind of thing with our positive red charge here. If we consider a charge on the outside of the sphere, so that green charge, Basically what that green charge sees is a big point charge at the center of the sphere. And so you would need calculus to rigorously prove this, so it's beyond the scope of this class, but this charge right here would be eh, a little bit closer than the center, but this charge right here would be way behind the center. And so those two, if you kind of did an average distance, so to speak, would act as if they're concentrated at the center. You know, same with this charge right up here and this charge down here. Basically, the average distance, if you will, would be at the center. You could do a more rigorous proof with calculus, but we don't need to do that. Um, in general, if I wanted to figure out the electric field or potential at point, at a point outside of a conductor, if I don't have a uniform shape like a sphere, then I have to rely on calculus to do that. So that particular green charge, we would have an electric force on it. And in order to calculate the electric force, we'd use the entire charge on the sphere. And then the distance to the center of the sphere would be our R value. And we would do the same thing to find the electric field. The voltage we would similarly do the charge on the sphere and the distance to the center. And we'll do an example here in just a second. So kind of an interesting um, application of this would be like a lightning rod. Lightning rods are pointy at one end and they kind of taper off to that point. And so since the surface of our lightning rod is an equipotential, meaning that all the points on the surface have to have the same voltage, so that's an equipotential line or even surface if you will, and we know that electric field lines cross equipotentials perpendicular to them, then what that means is where the lightning rod is pointy, we get this big electric field. 
And that's kind of sort of the point of a lightning rod is to control where the electric field is really large in a thunderstorm. And by doing that, we can control where the lightning would go. So the lightning was going to follow those electric field lines and hit our lightning rod, which we then ground to the earth so the charge is safely going to the earth rather than, you know, something else like your house or a person or a tree or whatever. And so a lightning rod is a good application of the fact that the surface of a conductor is an equipotential. Okay, so again, here's our charge sphere. Because that charge, the red charge again, um, the forces on it are balanced anywhere inside the sphere we go, that means it can move around the sphere without any loss of energy. So regardless of what path it follows, no work needs to be done on that charge. Voltage is constant throughout. Now, this is not like when we connect um, conductors to a battery, when we, like we will when we do our, our study of electric circuits. So this would be the equilibrium state of our conductor. So if we're constantly adding charges to our conductor, then those charges are going to constantly be moving from high voltage to low voltage, and then we have a current, and that's another, another topic for another day. Okay, so keeping in mind that a conductor is an equipotential surface, let's do a quick example. So here I've got a sphere, and the radius of the sphere is 20 centimeters, so a pretty big sphere, and it's carrying five microcoulombs of negative charge, and our job is to find the electric potential and field at a couple of different points. So point A is kind of sort of inside the sphere. It's 10 centimeters from the center of the sphere. Now, I can't directly calculate the electric potential at A. I don't know what R to use, and I don't know what Q to use, because there's Q all around point A. But we can use the fact that the whole sphere is an equipotential, and we can figure out the voltage at the surface of the sphere. So to do that, I would just do KQ over R, where R is the distance from the center of the sphere to the edge of the sphere, which in this case is the radius of 0.2 meters. And so after we figure that out, it's just a simple plug and chug. We get negative 2.25 times 10 to the fifth volts. And so that is the electric potential at point A. So I can't directly calculate it, but I can calculate it using the fact that the whole sphere is one equipotential surface. Um, same thing would be true about point B. Point B is 15 centimeters away from the center, so it's further away from the center, but it's still inside the sphere. And so that same voltage would apply for B. To figure out the electric field, well, that's, that's even easier. The electric field inside any conductor is always going to be zero. And so if I know that my point is inside a conductor, I simply say that it's zero because the forces on any charge inside my conductor have to be balanced. All right, so point C is 25 centimeters from the center of the sphere. That's outside the sphere. It's important to recognize that. And so we're not inside a conductor at point C. So when I find the electric potential, I'm still going to use the distance from the center. The center of the sphere is going to be my measurement point, but I'm going to use the distance all the way out to point C, kind of like normal. And so plugging in values, using the distance from the center of the sphere to point C of 0.25 meters, I get a voltage of negative 1.8 times 10 to the fifth volt. So it's smaller than the voltage inside the sphere, and that voltage would drop as I go infinitely far away to zero, just like always. To find the electric field, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna do KQ over R squared. Don't forget your squared this time. Remember when we do electric fields, we don't put the signs in with our charges because the sign doesn't tell us anything. Um, and then the R is again 0.25 meters. It's electric field, so we need to square it. And so I get a magnitude of the electric field of 1.1 times 10 to the 6 volt per meter. You can write newtons per coulomb, whatever your preference is. And then because it's an electric field, I need to indicate a direction. So I don't know which side of the um, sphere point C is on. And so I'm just going to say towards the sphere. So you can imagine C being part of a circle. And anywhere along that circle, the electric field will have that value, and it will be directed towards the sphere. 
So the big ideas here are to remember that the properties of conductors, like metals and graphite, allow charges to move through them without loss of energy. And that would be a chemistry question as to why. It has to do with the way electrons are bonded to particular atoms. That D sublevel, you may remember from your chemistry course, um, is, is really responsible for that. Um, and so because of that property, inside a conductor, the electric field is always zero and the voltage is constant. Till next time, ta-ta.